future and is. The great controversy we examine, the biblical approach to understand the greatest war ever reign. It's more, it's more like a title for a book than a lecture. But I believe that the Lord will really bless us as we are going to study this topic, the great controversy. One teaching in particular that has been one of the biggest contributions that Seventh-day Adventist Christians have given to Christian theology is the great controversy theme. How many of you have heard of this theme, great controversy theme? Alright, some of you have. And we're going to study what is this great controversy all about. You see, the great controversy attempts to show people a bigger perspective of um, why things have happened or are happening right now for the moment. Because you see, you can understand different events in human history, past, you can understand current events, present, and coming events, future, through a perception of the great controversy theme. Now most of this thinking Come, comes from this lady called Ellen White. Now she was born in 1827 and she lived to 1915. And she wrote 5,000 periodical articles, 40 books, 50,000 pages of manuscript. Can you believe that? Not with a computer. Imagine that. More than more than 100 titles are available in English, and she is the most translated woman in history. Hallelujah! Now, she wrote on topics such as religion, education, social relationship, evangelism, prophecy, publishing, nutrition, and management. And there, this, is a, this is a title that comes from uh, www.annawhite.com. Seventh-day Adventists believe that Mrs. White was more than a gifted writer. They believe she was appointed by God as a special messenger to draw the world's attention to the Holy Scriptures and how to prepare people for Christ's second advent. She was 70 years old, 17, sorry, not 70, 17 years old. She had, and she died 70 years later. God gave her approximately 2,000 visions and dreams. Now, you can't deny that she had supernatural events, but the question is, where did it came from? Are, are, are you with me? Because you can't deny that she had visions and dreams. Are you with me? Now, some people say it, doesn't, it didn't come from God. Some people say it well, It came. Now, we're going to study this, all right? The visions varied in length from less than a minute to for nearly four hours. Can you believe that? And this is history. I'm not making this up. The knowledge and counsel received through these revelations she wrote out uh, to be shared with others. Now, we are not going to, to see, you know, if she fulfilled the biblical, but we're going to see if she fulfilled one certain biblical criteria for visions and dreams and being a prophet, alright? And that is, the Bible says that they are supposed to speak uh, I'm put it according to the law and to the testimony. You see, whatever they say must be found in the Bible. It must be found in the Bible. The sola scriptura, God's word. If it is not found there, so I'm sorry. And she said, and now we're going to study the great controversy. First of all, who is it between and what is it about? So who is the battle between, according to her, the darkness before dawn, the great controversy between who? Christ and Satan. Christ and Satan. The great controversy between Christ and Satan. From the opening of the great controversy in heaven, Satan maintained his cause through deception, and Christ has been working. So from the very beginning, Christ and Satan has been having this controversy. And she's been writing this book, the great, it's, it's called The Great Controversy. It is between truth and error, it is between Christ and Satan. So according to her, the battle is between who? Christ and... I just want to make you, you know, I'm building up for something. So... Alright, so this is who is the battle between? 
and what is the battle about? Because this is the two questions that we ask. Who is the war that is about? According to her, she says in Darkness Before Dawn, from the very beginning of the great controversy in heaven, so the controversy began in heaven, it has been Satan's purpose to do what? To overthrow the law of God. The very essence of the great controversy, according to her, is the law of God. It was to accomplish this that he entered upon his rebellion against the Creator. Though he was cast out, the last great conflict between truth and error is but the final struggle of the long-standing controversy concerning the law of God. So what she says is, what happened in heaven will continue here on earth. So if there is a controversy, if there is a battle here right now, I want to understand what happened in heaven. Because if you understand what happened in heaven, you will exactly understand what the final battle is all about. And you will not be deceived in these last days. Are you with me? <laughs> and we read in Desire of Ages, in the opening of the great controversy, Satan declared that the law of God could not be obeyed. Have you heard that argument before? Yes. By human beings. You cannot keep the law. According to her, it comes from Satan. Now that's hard. That's hard. But according to... Desire of Ages, Satan said, you cannot keep the law. You cannot keep the law. Justice was inconsistent with mercy, and that the, if the law was broken, it is impossible for the sinner to be pardoned. Now, as I told you, here it is, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. I have, gi I have given you the quotes from Anna White. She says, who is it between, and what is it about? And now we're going to go to the Bible. We're going to study this fascinating topic, the great controversy, and I hope, hope you're ready, because it's perfect. Now, in Revelation chapter 12, now you see the book of Revelation is written in a beautiful way, because it is, it is building up the momentum, it is, it, it's called chiasms, you see, chapter 1 and chapter 22 is beginning like here, and it, it comes up. Like a momentum, it builds up the momentum. And the chiasm, the top of everything in the book of Revelation is chapter 12 to chapter 14. The, this is, you know, the last days of what is going to happen on before Christ comes back. Now, if you want to understand the book of Revelation, if you want to understand how you unlock the prophecies, you have to understand the uh, Revelation chapter 12. <coughs> For the moment, uh, our ministry called 3 a.m. Europe. Our ministry, we are preparing a lecture series. It's called uh, Cracking the Pro Cracking, sorry, Cracking the Code of Bible Prophecy. And we are doing a lecture series. If you understand Revelation chapter 12, you will understand every ism and schism in the world. I'm going to talk about it more. So what happened in heaven? And there was... Whoa. Oh. Isn't that interesting? There was what in heaven? War. Can you imagine that? When we read in the newspaper, there was war in I don't know where. We are so used to it. We are so used to it. But can you believe it? In a place where unity, harmony, goodness, and everything reigned, suddenly there was war in heaven. Can you see the significance of this verse? And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. And the dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now we see that there is a controversy according to the Bible. Can you see that? And it is between two camps, Michael and his angels, and Dragon and his angels. Question, who is the, who is the dragon? Satan. We, we, we discovered it in verse 9. Now the question is, who is this Michael? We will not have a Bible study about Michael himself, but it's interesting that the name Michael, Michael, means... He who is like God. It's a fascinating name. So, uh, an angel who is, because in the Bible, you know, they didn't have just names. Names also characterized 
their character. It, it showed their, their character. So, one who is like God and his angels are fighting against Satan and his, and his angels. Very good. And there was war in heaven. You see, the Greek word, because the New Testament was written in Greek, the Greek word that is used here for war is polemos. Polemos. Now, what does it mean, polemos? Is it from Wikipedia? A polemic is a, because you have this English word as well, polemic in the in English language. A polemic is a contentious argument that is intended to establish the truth of a specific understanding and the falsity of the contrary position. Polemics are mostly seen in arguments about very controversial topics. Isn't that interesting? When we when we read there was a war in heaven, we, we might see you know angels are fighting, you know like boxing. <laughs> I wouldn't deny that there was fight in heaven, but the Greek word polemos says that there were arguments in heaven. Can you see that? There were arguments. We haven't discovered from the Bible what the arguments are about, but there was war, there was polemos in heaven between Michael and his angels and dragon. Dragon, or Satan, was arguing for something. Let's continue. A person who authorized polemics, and here you see the word is derived from the Greek polemikos, meaning warlike, hostile, which comes from polemos, war. It's interesting that the same word polemos is used in Revelation chapter 12 in the same chapter, but in verse 17. You see, in verse 7 in, in Revelation chapter 12, it is what happened in heaven. Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, uh, 17 tells us what is going on on earth. And the dragon, who is the dragon? Satan. Satan was wrought with the woman. Now the woman is in Bible prophecy, God's people. And went to make war. Here it is. Poesai Polemon. To make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So whatever arguments were in heaven, whatever the controversy was about in heaven, it will be the same or similar here on earth. Satan is making war in heaven, poesai, pole, poesai, polemon, is making war in heaven, he's making war here on earth. The devil is using the same approach. He's not clever, you know. <laughs> He's not he, he did something and he said, I'm going to do it for the thousands of years. That's what he does. So let's see. Let us continue. The fall of Lucifer. We saw that there was war in heaven, but the angels were cast out. And the fall of Lucifer, here in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. I like this picture. It says, well, that didn't go the way I go. But, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? So it's a description of this angel, Lucifer. How art thou cut down from the ground which this weaken the nations? And listen to this. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the size of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Let me tell you, Lucifer had a high problem in heaven. <laughs> and if you see the fall of Lucifer, what is in the middle of Lucifer? Ah. Isn't that interesting? What is in the middle of sin? Ah. What is in the middle of pride? Ah. I. 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 Oh, bless you, sister. Very good. I like the pastor. Keep continuing. It makes preachers to go forward. Thank you. Amen. Now, it is the I is in the middle of Lucifer. Everything is about Jesus. On the other hand, it's about you, you, you. Satan is I, I, I. I. Yes, my son. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's very interesting, the uh, last verse that way he said, I will be like the most high. Mm. Mm. Come to that. All right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I go one step ahead, huh? <laughs> 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 
Now you see, he says, I would be like the most high. Question, who is the most high? God. Now that's the easy answer, isn't it? No. Now before I continue, let me show you a story. I, two, two years ago I was studying uh, in high school. I think in England it's called secondary, uh, what do you call it? Secondary. And uh, I, I had a lot of interesting discussions with my friends. A, you know, in Sweden, we've got a lot, lot of atheists. And this guy, he was very open. He said, I'm an atheist, but he wanted to discuss about God. And we discussed for hours and hours and hours and hours. And I told him, if you want to know anything about the Bible or God or Jesus or anything, just write to me. And this was one and a half years ago. One and a half. Now, he wrote to me last week. And he said, Sebastian, I think I have found God. <laughs> no, wait. <laughs> I said to him, and as you said, oh, praise the Lord. You know, can you tell me the, your testimony? And he said, well, you know, Sebastian, I was, as I was meditating, <laughs> this is his words, as I was meditating, I was looking into myself. Now, when you hear that, you're like, oh, yes. oh. <laughs> I was looking into myself. Mm -hmm. And I found my identity. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that I am God. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I have found God. I said, praise the Lord. I am God. I am part of creation. I am part you know, of all of this new age <laughs> kind of bubble. <laughs> So I've been writing to him, but immediately when I saw what he, what he said, that I am God, I read this. I will be like the most high. Mm -hmm. Satan, in the beginning, yes. wanted to take God's, God's position. Mm -hmm. And you said the most high is God, and that is true. Mm -hmm. The most high is God, but I think this term has a deeper... Uh, yes. Significant. It has a deeper value uh, of this. So let us study this. And if you have paper and pe uh, paper and a pen, write this down because this is amazing. Mm -hmm. Psalms chapter eighty-three, verse eighteen. That men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the Most High. Now the Hebrew name for Jehovah is Lord. All right. So we see that the Most High, you said it is God, and the Most High is God. The Most High and the Lord are one and the same. Are you with me? The Most High, let us say it together. The Most High and Jehovah are the same. Jehovah or Yahweh, it doesn't matter. Now in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, we find this. Remember, please. Most High or Jehovah or Lord, one and the same. Mm -hmm. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight the desert a highway for You see, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, is a, is a messianic prophecy. <coughs> it's a messianic prophecy about the coming Savior. And what is the Hebrew name that is used here? It is Yahweh or Jehovah. And Jehovah is the Most High. Now I wonder to myself, where in the New Testament do we find this? Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the fulfillment of the voice of him that cried in the wilderness. John the Baptist was a forerunner for the coming Messiah. And John the Baptist is preaching in the wilderness. He's saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. You see, Satan wanted to be like Jesus. He didn't want to be like God. But he wanted to be specifically Jesus. Isn't that amazing? 
Doesn't that prove the divinity of Jesus? Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. There's so much confusion in the Christian world right now regarding the divinity of Jesus. Oh no, he was just an angel or so on. He is the most high, friends. Who is the battle between? And then why is there the great controversy between Christ and Satan? Christ and Satan. Christ and Satan. I think Ellen White was spot on when it came to the first question. Who is the Bible between? She answered. Yes. And this is going back to the issue of me like the most high. Yes. Uh, that is connected with the name Michael. Mm -hmm. Because what does the name mean? Michael? He who is like God. So there is only one person who is like the most high. Mm -hmm. Which is Michael. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So interesting. This is what I was saying. Very interesting. And we read this in uh, Spirit of Prophecy. Jesus, God's dear son, had the preeminence over all the angelic hosts. Mm -hmm. He was one with the Father before all the angels were created. Satan was envious of Christ and gradually assumed command which devolved on Christ alone. I wonder where she get that from. Because according to my Bible, that's biblical. Satan was envious and jealous of Jesus Christ. You see, Satan was just a created being. As he saw Satan... His advance were met with success. He flattered himself that he should yet have all the angels on his side and that he would be equal with God himself. And his voice of authority would be heard in commanding the entire host of heaven. Amazing. Satan wanted to be like God, Jesus. Jesus Christ. And we find it from the Bible. I don't need to read you these folks. I can go strictly to the Bible. But to back it up, are you with me? Mm -hmm. So we discovered who it, who it is between. Now we will discover from the Bible what is it about. And now, whew, I hope you are not sleepy. <laughs> because this is going to be awesome. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. We see that the, dra the dragon, the devil, the Satan is cast out. And we are getting a, a description in Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. That there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, the great red dragon, Satan, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And listen to this. Verse 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and it cast them to the earth. So we get an insight into how Satan... Paralyzed heaven. Are you with me? Because there was unity in heaven. There was unity in heaven from the first place, but we discover in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, that there was two camps. It was Michael and his angels, and Satan and his angels. So, with his tail, he is taking one third of the stars. Now, what's that? Angels. angels. He's taking the angels. Now, we're not going to prove it, but that is biblical as well. You go to Revelation chapter 1. And you find that the stars are angels. So he took one third of the angels. But the question is, what symbolizes the tail? Hmm? Isaiah 9.15. Praise the Lord. We have a Bible student. Very good. You might, did you saw it? No, just kidding. <laughs> no, just kidding. In Isaiah 9.14. Thank you, brother. We find that therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel... Head and tail, branch and rod in one. The ancient and honorable, he is the head. And the prophet that teaches lie is the, is the tail. Thank you, brother, once again. So tail represents, because remember, the book of Revelation, you have 404 verses, I think. And more than 270 verses in the book of Revelation are directly taken from the Old Testament. So if you want to understand the book of Revelation, you have to understand the Old Testament. And according to Isaiah, because the book of Revelation is written in symbols, and the Old Testament uncovers them, and you really see that, that the tale teaching lies. So we see another insight into the war in heaven. Satan is presenting arguments, but these arguments, are they right or are they false? They are false. They are lies. 
they are deceptions. So Satan, in heaven, deceived one third of the angels. Question. Did Lucifer come to the angels and say, Hey Maris, do you want to be evil with me? <laughs> do you think that the angels would fall for that argument? Yes or no? No, because the angels are very clever, they are intelligent, they, have, they are very clever. So, uh, Lucifer, are you kidding me? Evil? I don't even know that... It's not in, in, in my vocabulary. You know? So, Lucifer, what are you talking about? So Satan must have used some very good arguments, false though, but very good arguments to deceive these holy angels. Now let us see another description of this angel. In Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 and 9, where we have the description of this angel. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation unto the, unto the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the Son, full of wisdom, and perfect in duty. Now, it is a description of the king of Tyrus. Nevertheless, we will find in verse 13, that thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Question, was the king of Tyrus in in the Garden of Eden? No. no. So it must have been, it must be another angel. Not angel, but, you know, being. <coughs> it is none other than Satan. We will discover why. And it is perfect in beauty. Can you imagine that? God created this being perfect. God didn't create Lucifer as the devil. Lucifer chose to become the devil. Are you with me on that point? That's very important. Because if God would have created Lucifer as the devil, as being one who is evil, then God himself is evil. But since God is a God of love, and, and He is a God who gives free will or free choices to His beings, He doesn't force anybody, Lucifer himself, chose to become Satan or devil. And many people, they think, you know, that Satan is, is a kind of this being. But that is wrong. He's a very beautiful angel. He's still an angel. Mighty angel. So thou hast been in the Garden of Eden. Every precious stone was thy covering. And then you have all the stones, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in the day that thou was created. Now it's interesting that thy pipes was prepared. How many of you have heard that Satan was the choir master in heaven? Have you heard that? Yeah. Now I wonder to myself, do we have any biblical uh, support for that? Thy pipes. In the Hebrew, this, it, is, it is like musical instruments. That was. And if Satan had prepared, you know, it was given to him. I wondered to myself, is music neutral? Yes or no? Because if Satan was the, you know, uh, I'm coming to you soon, but if music, or rather, if Satan was the choir master in heaven, he is doing a very good job here now. Yes. I've heard it said that. He could sing a three-part harmony all by himself. It's a spirit of prophecy. Mm. So, it's not in my notes. Sorry? I didn't get it properly. I think that there's anything bad with With music itself? No. Music is from God. But there is... How should I, how should I put it? A controversy. Yeah. There is... I don't want to discuss music right now, sorry. Yeah, all right. But uh, I believe that there is music that comes from God, but there is music that comes from the devil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he was prepared with the pipes in the Hebrew. We see it as a musical instrument. He was, he mastered music, and I believe he masters music here right now. 
I know you don't want to go deep into this, uh, but because I know it's maybe a hot potato somewhat, just like to add that if we take the situation of Saul with David, there was a music that David played to Saul that the Hebrew spirit, the Bible said the Hebrew spirit left him when David played that music. By converse, you can see that there might there are music that can draw evil spirits mm -hmm. close to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, you wanted to say. Um, yeah, with the point that you said that there's music that comes from God and there's music that comes from Satan, I disagree with that. Mainly because we see that the reason why Satan wanted to be equal to God was he wanted to have the same power as God. We find that he doesn't, and he didn't, and he still doesn't. Meaning he's not able to create anything. Then, I agree on that point. He perverts. Exactly. So he, he doesn't have the ability to create. People say Satan creates bad things. He gives people bad things. Satan can't give anything. He can't create anything. What sure. he does is he takes the truth and he manipulates it. And sure, he, turns he perverts it. it. Absolutely. Turns I agree on that point. He, he perverts what, what is coming from God. So Modify, thank you. Modifies it. Yeah. Modification. Um, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So thank you for your comments. Although it was not my intention to give you. <laughs> but now, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Interesting. And I have said thee, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Mm -hmm. So this angel was in the presence of God. Mountain of God, that is what it is. And thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. My question is, <coughs> covereth. Have you heard of covereth angels? Angels that are covering? Mm -hmm. Because if we understand what the task of a covering angel is, that we understand what Satan did in heaven. So where in the Bible do we find angels covered? Very good. Very good. Ark of the Covenant. Uh, basically this is in Exodus chapter 25. Uh, Thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Uh, shall make two cherubims of gold and make one cherub and they are basically yes now verse 20 and the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high do what? covering 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 the mercy seat with their wings the mercy seat is there and shall look one to another toward the mercy seat shall at the face of the cherubims be and thou shalt put the mercy seat above the above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the what? What is the testimony? The decalogue, the, the law of God that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. So God is going to commune there, all right? Between the two cherubims and all things which I give thee in commandment to the children of Israel. Now, when did God appear here? We are studying this, Sabbath school, century. Once in here. Once in here. And what happened during that day? It was judgment. Judgment. God was judging the people. Now, how, how was he judging the people? You see, God is appearing here. Let's see. What is in the bottom of the ark? The law of God. The mercy seat is a symbol of God's throne. You find it in the, in the epistle to the Hebrews. It is, the mercy seat is the throne of God. And God would appear on his throne judging the people. Listen to this. God's throne is based upon God's law. The foundation of God's throne is the law of God. And the throne of God, in other words, the government of God, is built upon the principles of God's eternal law. Because the law must be eternal. 
is the law shows the character of God. Paul says, how can you fulfill the law? By love. Doesn't the Bible say that God is love? love? This word, covering, 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 put it on your mind, covering, covering. What did I say? Covering. Thank you. You see, the Hebrew word that is used here for covering, I'm not going to pronounce it. It means to cover, protect, or defend. What did it mean? Protect or defend. So a covering cherub is a cherub that defends something. A covering cherub does what? Defend. A covering cherub defends. And what are they defending, do you think? The law of God. So, Sebastian, are you telling me that Satan's task in the, I'm coming, is Satan's task in heaven was to protect the law of God? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Satan was a covering cherub. He was protecting the law of God. He was protecting the principles of God's government. Mm -hmm. And when he's protecting the principles of God's government, he is basically saying, God, you are a righteous God. Mm -hmm. Yes. You're saying the law of God is the law of God. Sorry? The law of God is the law of God. You, the, the, the law can be fulfilled through law, says Romans chapter 13. And Jesus says on the mercy seat, which is on the top of the law of God, yes. which is the law of God. Yes. So as he judges, as he judges. you have Jesus on the mercy seat, Yes. And basically, if you, I don't, thank you so much. That, that that's a good point. And also, the in in what is it? Ecclesiastes chapter twelve. The Bible says that the judgment will be uh, that the yeah the principles of the judgment is if you keep the law or not. So it is. So once again, the law of God is the foundation for God's government. Now, if the law is the foundation of God's government, and you know, you see, there are two angels. Now, there is a controversy between who is the second covering angel in heaven, who was with Lucifer. Some say it was Gabriel. Some say it was Gabriel, uh, but we don't know, that's a speculation. But it's quite interesting that there are two angels covering the law of God. That's what Satan did in heaven, that's amazing. But what happened? Ezekiel 20, 28, 15, Thou was perfect in thy ways from the way that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, in other words, he was selling, he was selling the arguments that you cannot keep the law. We're coming to that. They have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. And therefore I will cast thee as a profane out of the mountain and destroy thee, O covering church from the stones of fire. Question, what is sin? Violation of the law. Exactly, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, everyone who sins breaks the law, for sin is lawlessness. Satan sinned in heaven, thus he couldn't be, or he couldn't stay in heaven. Now that's very, very interesting. He began to rebel against the law that was governing the government of God, and he began sharing his lies. The tale, you remember, with his tale. And what was it? Deception. Deception. Lies. You cannot keep the law. You don't need a law to be good. You don't need to have a law to be... And, and so on. Because he saw the law as being a bondage, not as, you know, as it is a liberty. Because that's what James says. 
the law, it is the liberty of the law. That's what you think. What is the foundation of God's throne again? God's law. Let us say it together. Because <laughs> the, what is the foundation of God's law? The God's throne? God's throne. God's throne. God's throne. Perfect. Lucifer is setting up his own throne. Uh oh. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. What is he saying? I will exalt my own government. I'm going to govern this universe. He says, Lucifer, you can't do that. So he's being cast out. But Lucifer is coming to this earth and he says, I'm going to exalt my throne. Has he succeeded? Yes or no? Lucifer says, I can be like, yes. Is, is, uh, um, again, again, um, you can still see the consistency in what Lucifer is trying to do when he said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. You just mentioned a few minutes ago, what? Who are the stars of God? You know, the stars in the Bible prophecy are angels. Right? So here he's saying he, he, he exalts himself above the angels. In the Bible, there is somebody in the Old Testament in particular, the Bible calls him the Lord of Hosts. Mm -hmm which is the, the, the leader of the angel, yeah. and that is only Christ. So it's still, you see consistency and insistence that you actually want to take the position of Christ. Because if there is anybody who was above the stars of God, it was Christ. You know, but there was something about Jesus that Lucifer didn't actually thought he could easily overcome him. Because Jesus, when he was on earth here, um, he was very humble. Um, when, when, when they come to arrest him, they actually didn't know who was Jesus, you know, until he himself said and, and told them, it is me. Why? Because there was not, nothing in his dress that actually yeah. made him different from the other apostles. Sure. 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 So, he was humble, it's the same character of humble in heaven, I mean in earth. Yeah. He was like that, that actually like heaven. So, Lucifer deceived himself that, well, this man actually, yeah, he has the power, in, he is the Lord of course. But he is that humble, and then, therefore, I can actually take his position. Yes. Mm. yes. So it's when you hear that he will uh, put his uh, throne above the stars of God. He wants to be equal with God. Christ. Yes. Yes. With Christ. Christ. Yes. Thank you so much. So, what do you think the foundation of Lucifer's throne is? Hmm? Like, 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 like. <laughs> you see, in order to understand what the foundation of Lucifer's throne is, uh, we need to go to occultism. Because within occultism, you find the teachings of Satan. Are you with me? Because within occultism, Lucifer is being declared as a god. I don't want to mention any societies, but you know which societies I am talking about. There are societies that are saying that Lucifer is god. And Adonai, god, is a bad. He's bad. That's interesting. So let's go to occultism and see what is the foundation of Lucifer's throne. Because when we understand that, we will understand what is this. Have you heard of Alistair Crowley? Yeah. He's a very nice man, right? <laughs> he has a fine pentagram on the book. And he has said, that, first of all, let us read, read who this guy is. Crowley was an English occultist, ceremonial magician, oh, <coughs> who was responsible for founding the religion of Kalama. We don't have to go into In his role as the founder of philosophy, he came to see himself as the prophet. He was entrusted with informing humanity that it was entering the new eon of Horus in the early 20th century. It is a kind of new age. All right? Crowley also had a wider influence in British popular culture. He was included as one of the figures of the cover art of Beatles. Uh oh, what is he doing there? What his motto, do what thou wilt. We're going to come back to that. But this was his motto, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Was inscribed on the vino of Led Zeppelin. Uh oh, what is he doing on Led Zeppelin? Oh. And David Bowie, oh. I might be stepping on some toes now. Huh? Made reference to Crowley in the lyrics of his song, Quicksand. Here is the Beatles album, 
And he is just there. What is he doing? I mean, come on, he's an occultist. What is he doing on Beatles? Oh, we're coming to that person in a minute. We are coming to that person in a minute. Alistair Crowley, he says, but under the leadership of Alistair Crowley, the open was reorganized around the law of Thelma. As its central religious principle, this law expressed as do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. That's what Satan said in heaven. Mm -hmm. Do whatever you want. You don't have to keep the law. That is legalism. That is fanaticism. You don't have to keep the law. Because if you keep the law, you are a slave. That's what it said. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And if you read the great controversy, you read Desire of Ages, you read exactly the same quotes. And, sorry, here is a person whom I listen to very much. He says, what is it there? What is it doing there? And it's not a, it's not Photoshop. I, I, I researched it. Jay-Z. Do what thou wilt. So also we see in the entertainment, in the entertainment industry, we find that the same principles of Lucifer re rebellion in heaven is entering, and within the entertainment industry, everything is going out. Mm -hmm. And our young people, children, and you know, people, they are listening to this music and watching the movies, and they are slowly programmed into thinking, "Do what thou wilt shall be the whole world." While God says, keep my law. Mm -hmm. Now. So when you understand what happened in the beginning, when you comprehend what was the trigger of the controversy, you understand the bigger picture in the Bible. You understand the character of God. You understand the ministry of Satan and his angels. You understand the identity and the mission of the Antichrist. In the book of Daniel and Revelation, according to the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 2, the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So the Antichrist system during this earth would do exactly like Satan did in heaven. What, what did Satan do in heaven? No law. Or let's break the laws. What does the Antichrist system do? Break the laws. It will try to take the place of Jesus Christ. Antichrist. Not in the anti, it also means to be against, but it also can mean to be in the place of, in the Greek, anti, in the place of Christ. Satan said as well, I want to be like the Most High. I want to be like Satan. And the Antichrist system is doing that as well. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. Do you understand the significance of the Most High right now? Mm -hmm. If I would put up Isaiah 14 and Daniel 7, you would see that the Antichrist system and Satan are doing the same, or they have the same ministry. Mm -hmm. To go against the Most High, Satan did it as well. Shall wear up the saints of the Most High mm -hmm. and think to change. You cannot change God's law, but it think, think, things to change, times and laws. And they shall be given unto his hand for a time. It is doing the same thing as Lucifer did in heaven. When you understand once again what Satan did in heaven, you will understand the great controversy here on earth. Mm -hmm. You will understand every ism, every schism. You will understand atheism in the bigger picture. Atheism says we don't need a moral law. We don't need the moral law to be, you know, God, so we know, we, I mean, I'm a good person, come on, I'm paying taxes, I'm taking care of my children, why do I need to have a moral law? That's exactly what Satan said. You will understand, New Age, New Age says you can be God, New Age combined with Dar Darwinian, Darwinian evolution, you know, there are some New Age concepts, they say they take the, you know, scientific evolution, as they call it, and they put it into New Age, and they say that you can become, or you, de you, yeah, you develop, you are processing to become a God. You understand uh, the Antichrist power, as I said, as well. 
So it's kind of fascinating. So you can use this uh, lecture, you can use this presentation if you have a Bible study with somebody who wants to know more about the Bible. You give them the full picture and then you go into detail. All right, who is the Antichrist? What is the mark of the beast? The importance of the Sabbath? And so on. Listen to this. Have you seen Star Wars? Now, nobody wants to put up his head. We have the Church of God. Absolutely. But have you seen Star Wars? Yes. Yeah, I have, I have seen Star Wars. <laughs> now, how many parts does it consist of? Because it's Six. a huge... Uh, how many parts does it have? Six. Six, exactly. Now my question is, Star Wars. Which movie what, uh, did they make first? The first one? Or the last one? No. The last they one. made the fourth first. Because it has six parts. And they made the fourth one first, the fifth one second, the sixth one third, yeah? And then first, second, and third. So when I saw, you know, Star Wars, the fourth part, I didn't understand anything. I said, who is this Darth Vader? And who is this? Jedi, who, what, what is going on? I didn't understand the plot. I didn't understand what it was about. But when I saw the first part, the second part, the third part, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, then I understood what it was about. You see, when we give Bible studies to people, we give the fifth part. And they say, why is it important? You have understood the, the, the importance of the Sabbath. But the people who, who you are studying with, they go, why do I need to keep the Sabbath? I mean, if, if you keep the Sabbath and I keep the Sunday, it doesn't matter. But when you begin in the, what happened in the great controversy, Satan said, uh uh, we don't need a law. Do you follow me? Yes. Good. You give the beginning part. You don't have to even mention the Sabbath. Satan rebelled against God. Antichrist system tries to change the law. God's law says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And when you ask, what was the ministry of Satan in heaven? And they say it was to keep the law. You have almost the Seventh-day Adventist sitting next to you. Because they have understood what is going on. And then you give, and when you present the Sabbath, they cannot say, you know, Sunday, because, you know, Satan said, you don't need to keep the law. It's fascinating. And at the end, Revelation chapter 12, God is looking for a people who will, and the dragon was wrought with a woman. Why? Went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Do you see why it is so important to keep the commandments? You don't keep the commandments in your own power, you keep them in the power of God. But this is a characteristic of God's people in the last days. Also in Revelation chapter 14 verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And listen to this, Revelation chapter 22 14, we are coming to an end. Listen to this. Blessed are they that do what? That do His commandments. That they may have right to the tree of life and may enter into the gates of the city. You see, Satan was kicked out of heaven. Why? Because he did not keep... Come on. The law. The people who will go in and have the right to the tree of life. What are they doing? They keep his commandments. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Satan was kicked out because he didn't keep the law. The people going in, they are keeping the law. Beautiful. And that, uh, that's, that's mean, uh, the way that doesn't mean that we want to go to the city, but not through the gate. According to the verse, they will enter the city through the gate. It doesn't mean there will be some people who actually want to enter the city, but not through the gate. Hmm. I haven't thought of it. There will be a people who, you know, everybody wants to go to heaven if you ask yes. now. Yes. You know? Everybody wants to go to heaven. But the reality is, will everybody go to heaven? No. no. Because they don't want to go, go through the gate. God has actually ordained a particular way. Mm. There is only one way, you know? 
So they would like to go but look through again. And they pass it And we discovered this morning that not everybody who says Lord, Lord, Lord will come to them, but only those who do that will. Exactly. Question. Very And the time of this ignorance God winked at. Sister, William, the times of this ignorance God winked at. In other words, if God, you know, God sees the heart. If you haven't had the, the truth about the Sabbath, He cannot judge you. God would not be a righteous God. But if you know the truth, and you decide not to keep it, then the light, which would have been a blessing for you, now becomes a curse. You see? So God is a righteous God. God is a good God. Put this on the mind. At, and the times of this ignorance, God will. You know, if you don't have an, in, an, an information about something, God will not hold you accountable. That is the word. God will not hold you accountable for that. So the question is, should we pray for more light? That's another topic. <laughs> yes. So let us spread it up because we are one minute and then we end it. We close with a prayer, right? His law lies at the foundation of his government in earth and in heaven. Review and Harold. And then White says, we saw it's biblical. And a and last quote. The warfare against God's law, which was begun in heaven, will be continued until the end of time. Every, how many? Every. Every man will be tested. Obedience or disobedience is the question. And as I said, every day you are doing choices. Good or bad. Are you obedient to God or are you disobedient? Obedience or disobedience is the question to be decided by the whole world. All will be called to choose between the law of God and the laws of men. Here the dividing line will be drawn. There will be but two classes. But two, God's law or the law of men. Mm. Every character will be fully developed. Mm. And all will show whether they have chosen the side of loyalty or that of rebellion. Then the end will come. I encourage you to take the step towards God right now. You are choosing every day. Are you loyal to God or are you taking part of the rebellion of Satan? And Jesus says, or rather, Ellen White says, but also this is from Matthew chapter 24, that when the loyalty will be found among God's people, the end will come. Just as the Israelites, when they were loyal to God, they could enter the promised land, but then when we will be loyal, we can go in to heaven. So, let us pray. And thank you for coming. And uh, I... I really appreciate that you came. I hope it was a blessing for you. Amen. Yes. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. That, uh, we thank you that you have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. And thank you, Lord, that you lived the perfect life. And you were the perfect death. And now you are a mediator in heaven. And you are the, com you are the soon coming King. Thank you, Lord, that you are coming soon to take us from this world. And Lord, let, let us give us the Holy Spirit so that we can be loyal to you, Lord, every day of our lives. Control our thoughts, control what we say, Lord. And may every day our character be changed to your glory. Thank you, Lord, whatever you are doing in our lives, we give everything into your hands, Lord. And thank you that soon you will come. This is the blessed hope. We are so looking forward to you will come. But until then... 
Help us to be accounted on these people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. This is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I'm sorry for being. No, no, no. I was actually going to say. Um,